We are here with Evan Beard, who is the CEO, founder of Standard Bots. Evan, it's so great to be here and see everything that you're doing in action. Thank you for coming. For, for folks who don't know about Standard Bots, what is it in a couple sentences? So we saw this opportunity a few years ago to build a robot that's easier to use, more affordable, and can do so many more tasks. Um, robots today are pretty limited. They really programmed with something that resembles computer code, where it's like pretty step by step. It's really hard to handle variability, like things are in a different spot, or um, they're a different size, or shape, or color. So we have this whole new way to program a robotic arm using uh, AI models, where you can just demonstrate to the arm what the task is, and it learns from that demonstration. And okay, the genesis, the vision for standard bots, where did that come from? We realized that if, if we can make a robot that's easier to program and more affordable and, and is American made, because over 99% of robots aren't made in this country, that it can bring back jobs to this country, it can improve national security, it's better for the environment, it saves on transport costs. There's so much good, it lowers the cost of food and other items for foes, people who can't afford them the most. So we realize there's so much good that can happen by making a robotic arm here in America, here on Long Island, that's easier to program. And so that was our inspiration. And, been working really hard on that. I mean, I think everyone can agree that's a great thing, but the actual mechanism of making that happen is, is pretty tricky. I mean, most robotic companies, it seems like, come out of the MIT lab because it requires PhDs and a tremendous amount of funding. Yeah. So how did you create something like this? It's not the same as raising a few yeah. million to start a new app for emojis. Yeah, for sure. Well, I definitely can't take credit. I think a quarter of our team is from MIT, so we definitely have. <laughs> <laughs> the support of some MIT folks, but it's been uh, it's been an amazing team over a long period of time, really slogging it out. And we raised our seed round during COVID, and we've worked you know extremely hard, long hours for long long amount of time to try to fulfill this mission. Yeah. So how did this how did this start? I know I know you've been operating for a few years. Did you wake up one idea one day and have this idea, or or how did you kind of fall into this? Yeah, it was a friend and myself in our New York City apartment. You know. Pretty, pretty small and we were just building different, we built like a Segway robot that could kind of like self-balance, could control it with an Xbox controller and then we built uh, like a mobile base and we built plastic robotic arms and we tried carbon fiber robotic arms. So it's really, and we built grippers, it's been an evolution. And then we saw this opportunity where we can build, you know, an American made robotic arm that's a lot easier to program and can do so many more tasks. And so we focused on that a few years ago. We raised our seed funding during COVID, uh, right about COVID, uh, we actually started to run out of money, and we really wanted to get the arm to actually work before we raised our funding. So transferred everything I had into the bank account, kept it alive. We got it to work uh, just before we almost ran out of money a second again. And you know, I'd say a few few months later, in the middle of COVID, no one could come to the factory. That was another huge challenge. Yeah. We had there was a part in the robot, the FET, which switches the power on and off. It was actually exploding for a small amount of time. And what would happen is these little pieces of metal would shoot out into the wall or the ceiling and would hide behind the door over there. And we'd, we'd run it and we have to wait five seconds to know if it would work. So we've had, um, and then we got through that. And that was a lot of debugging remotely on the phone because people couldn't travel and those types of things in the middle of COVID. But, uh, and then it was very hard going from a robot arm first moving to our first customer. So we've had so many challenges along the way, kind of building from, you know, like rethinking robotic arm from scratch from like the you know first principles how do we build this thing how do we make it more affordable easier to manufacture uh better specs lift more go faster and we've really vertically integrated here we design our own motors our own motor controllers our own you know we assemble our own circuit boards right here so almost every component even our own encoders are designed by our team so almost everything in the robotic arm we've built and designed and figured out how to assemble it in an efficient way um, we have a new facility we're opening that's completely vertically integrated. We're doing, you know, we're painting them ourselves, we're bending the metal, we're welding, we're machining the parts. So we're really excited about that. It's going to be an American-made robotic arm. Wow. And uh, yeah. I mean, give, so given the challenges of that, why did you decide? Okay, we want to do it all here. Was it supply chain issues? What was the genesis of that? Because I've got to think it's much pricier to do everything here, especially yeah. in New York. Yeah, that is the common, that's what people think. But actually, we can buy raw materials like aluminum for the same price you can buy them in China. There's, you know, global commodity market. And if we can automate a lot of the production, 
um, we can actually bring jobs back to this country mm. and we can compete on price. So, so that's the beauty of automation is it's, you know, we can kind of have our cake and eat it too in that way. Interesting. And what, what do you think you are offering with these robotic arms that existing robotic companies aren't already doing? Yeah, the number one thing we're doing is you can train the arm by, we have a handheld device, it's right here. And I uh, love that. I love a show and tell moment. Yeah, so, so with this device, you actually just perform, you pull the trigger and it, and it moves the gripper. And you can put different things on here. It doesn't have to be two fingers. It can be you know, three finger gripper. It can be a massage tool. It could be a sander, whatever you want to put on here. And you just demonstrate the task using this. And by performing the task, it's recording video, it's recording the position of this device, and it trains an AI model. And then the robot learns how to perform that task on its own. So this is something that no other robot OEM has right now. I think we're one of the leaders in the world for this technology, and we're doing it right here in New York. Amazing. You know, it's interesting because I think about the things in our society that have advanced rapidly and have not. And obviously we've seen artificial intelligence is expanding and increasing by leaps and bounds, but yeah. it seems like, although there's so much excitement about robotics, it seems like it's taking a lot longer to develop robotics than a lot of other technologies. Why is that? I think because it's so multidisciplinary. You have to have folks who are good at electronics and good at hardware and good at manufacturing and, and great at software and, you know, it's, there's so many different fields that you need to bring together and, and make good decisions and I think it just makes it really hard. Yeah, and, and how has AI impacted what you're doing here? Because I understand it's helpful for programming the robots. What has that meant over the last few years as you've integrated and adapted this technology? Yeah, well this, this stuff is brand new. So uh, we're just bringing it to market this year. It's something that uh, we've got lots and lots of folks really excited about from Fortune 500s down to smaller companies. What the, the net effect is that robot arms can do many more tasks than they could do in the past. And the reality today is most things aren't automated. So if you go to like your average factory, most of the tasks in those factories are still performed by humans. Even iPhones, it's like six, five, six hours of human labor wow. per iPhone. And there's just too much variability. Like maybe it's a little harder to tighten the screw, or you might drop the screw, or you know, it's really hard to have all those parts in the exact same position. Because most robot arms today just replay a motion. Mm -hmm. So if you can now take this device and show it how to do something, like assemble an iPhone, that opens up so many more things to automation, you know, within manufacturing, but also you know, across the broader world, like dishwashing and um, fast food cooking and things like that as well. In the next five years, what industries do you think will be most impacted by these robotic arms? Within manufacturing, there's a huge opportunity to bring back, uh, I think assembly is one of, the, one of the first things. There's so many things that are assembled not in this country. Like if you go on Amazon, most of the items we buy are not made in America anymore. Yeah. So I think that is a huge opportunity to bring back manufacturing. Um, outside of manufacturing, I think things like cooking, dishwashing, uh, you know, there's lots of other industries, and I think that it's going to be progressive. There are some tasks that are just outside of reach of existing robot technology, and there are others that are harder and harder. And I think over time we'll see, we'll see that, you know. But maybe in five years, we'll have a robot washing our dishes. Do you think that's possible? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And how much does one of these robot arms cost? Uh, right now, the list price is thirty-seven thousand. We're working on a smaller robotic arm that has a lower price, so. Okay, and yeah. you also raised uh, a recent round. You had Amazon, Samsung, some really interesting investors along with uh, more conventional venture yeah. capitalists. What kind of conversations are you having with those investors about how you want to deploy this technology with them? Most of our capital is being spent on people. So, you know, research and development, go to market. We're building out our go to market team, growing, uh, growing our number of appointments quite a bit. And so, yeah. Are you, are you talking with them? Because obviously that would be a really interesting use case to deploy this technology in one of their factories. Is that something that you foresee happening? I think that those types of use cases, absolutely, but can't speak specifically to them today. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. Um, and tell us a little bit more about New York, why you have stayed here. Because I think, you know, and even speaking with Jacob, um, there's certain cities that seem to have really created an impressive and sort of holistic community that's yeah. able to build robotics. So why did you stay here? I mean, you're really one of the only people who's manufacturing <laughs> robots, maybe the only person <laughs> who's manufacturing robots. 
You're in the city, so why did you want to stay in New York to make this happen? Well, it's the greatest city on earth. So we've got, we've got a lot of the talent. We've got the engineers. We've got the investors. They either live here or they're frequently traveling here. So really, New York City, it has this whole ecosystem. It's got, uh, it's got support. You know, New York Robotics Club has been great. They've been super supportive. It's got everything that you need in a city to, to create a company like this. And I think it's important to be near a hub like that. Mm -hmm. What is the dream company that you would love to work with? You know, I think for us, the dream company is one that makes a really big impact. So I think personally, if there were, you know, this isn't the answer our investors would, <laughs> would give, but I think if there was like a soup kitchen where we could start, you know, making food for people so that we could feed a lot of people, that would be super impactful. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. Why do you think, I feel like people are obsessed with humanoid robots. I think when people think of robotics, they imagine a robot that looks like a person, yeah. but that doesn't seem necessarily the most effective tool. Yeah. What is this fixation with human ro humanoid robots, and do you think that that fixation actually makes sense given what they're able to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that humanoid robots capture our hearts and minds, and they look awesome, and I think for all those reasons it makes sense that we're interested in them. I think that eventually the humanoid will be a, a very interesting form factor. Humanoid. Robots, we think that our approach of using a single arm to be able to train new tasks is one that uh, can get to market faster and have a bigger impact than a humanoid, which is always going to be more expensive, and we think they're going to be a few years away from really making an impact in the market. Interesting. Um, A24, which is another New York company, has created a lot of fascinating films. I understand that you worked with them on a film. Tell us about that and how that happened. Yeah, there's a A24 film coming out on Christmas Day. It's called Baby Girl. Uh, in the movie, Nicole Kidman plays a robotics company CEO, and they used a lot of our robots in various scenes throughout the movie. And we're really excited about that. Jimmy and I are in a scene. So really? It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great movie. I hope everybody goes to see it. You, you kind of touched on some of the advantages and disadvantages of manufacturing mm -hmm. here. How did you? end up deciding that you did want to stay here as opposed to sourcing things from China? What went into that decision making process? I think we see from both presidential candidates right now, they both talk about the importance of having manufacturing here because it can bring back jobs, better for national security, better for the environment, um, all these things. So we think it's important to make things here. And, and when we, re we really did the math to figure out, can we compete on price? When we realized we could compete on price here with anyone in the world, it became a clear choice. It's just so much easier to, to have our engineering team near where we're manufacturing so that we can you know, iterate more quickly, debug problems, all those kind of things. It's so interesting. Are you like Elon Musk where you'll sleep on the factory floor? Uh, I live five minutes away, so I don't sleep here, but definitely we look, everybody works long hours. So. Cl close enough that you don't need to. <laughs> how, how long is a typical day? Uh, I. I pretty much work every waking moment. <laughs> I'm not with my kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And tell me a little bit more about your background. Did you study robotics? Did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? How did you end up raising all this money for a robotic company? Yeah, I did, uh, I did computer science at Duke, and I graduated and did this program called Y Combinator right out of school, where they give you some money and they teach you how to start a company. Um, and when I was in Y Combinator, there was a guy, Trevor Blackwell, and he was building humanoid robots. And I was working on a software company. And they would come in and they would be so excited about building these. You could just see the excitement and you could feel it every day. And I just said, wow, I should be doing that. <laughs> um, so that was my initial inspiration. I've told Trevor that. But, uh, but yeah, for, I think it's, for me, it's a passion. Like This is so much fun every day to get to work on this. Uh, really fortunate that we have some, some really great backers behind us. But we think it can make a big impact in the world. And, and it's also really fun, and I think when you can combine those, that's, that's magic. And I know a lot of the team feels that way, too. So I've got to thank you're one of the only robotic manufacturers in New York. How many people are doing what you're doing here in the US? I think we are the only one making robotic arms in the New York area. I think we might be the only, our next arm might be the only made in America robotic arm. 99.9% .9 of arms sold here in the United States are not made here right now. That's crazy. 
Are there government subsidies that you can access? Is there any sort of incentive for companies to be manufacturing robotics here? Not that I know of. We're, and if would love to access if you know of anyone. So. <laughs> Sorry, that's not a great answer. But. No, I, I, I think that's really fascinating because, yeah, there is so much emphasis right now on yeah. trying to make chips here, trying to make sure that our supply chains are Yeah, I think we should here. do more to bring robot, you know, incentives for robotics companies to start here because it's hard to compete at times, Yeah, especially to get started. I, I also am curious, too, because I think people feel a lot of fear when they think about robots. They think about their jobs being replaced. They think about some sort of doomsday, apocalyptic scenario. Yeah. Do you think those fears are founded or are they over-dramatized? Well, industry sh stats right now show we have a shortage of something like 3 million manufacturing workers over the next few years. And the reality is a lot of young people don't want boring and dangerous jobs. So certainly for the foreseeable future, we have a large number of people that we need to backfill just to cover what's already made here. And that, that doesn't even start to uh, account for the, the people that we're going to need to bring manufacturing back to the United States. So, Yeah, and what about the scenario of, and a lot of, I think Elon Musk, a lot of folks have signed off on this letter that they're afraid that robots could potentially take over the human race. Do you think that's founded in reality? I think that, I think we're a decade away or more from having to think about that. Okay, so we have a little bit more time before yeah. we need to worry about being taken over. And in two sentences, can you describe what exactly Standard Bots is? We're making tools so that anyone can build an app or business on a robot just by showing the robot what they want it to do through these handheld training devices.